Eureka! The story so far. Machines don't reduce the energy you need to move things, but they can reduce the force you need. They do this by increasing the distance through which you exert your force. The two simplest machines are the incline plane and the lever. The principle of the lever states that the longer the arm of the lever to which force is applied, the less that force need be. And now, mechanical advantage and friction. Here are two scientists, Professor A and Professor B. They are both equally strong. And here is a very heavy book about science. We are now going to perform a scientific experiment. We are going to find out which of the two professors can lift the book with the lesser amount of force. First, Professor A. Hmm, 24 newtons of force. Now, Professor B. Only, what, six newtons? Well, there's no doubt about it. Professor B is the winner. You're quite right. It's not fair. Professor B had an unfair advantage. He used a machine, a lever, to give himself a mechanical advantage, in fact. But just how much mechanical advantage did the lever give Professor B? It's easy to work out. Both professors lifted the book to a height of about 10 centimeters. Professor A lifted it straight up. So he had to pull against the full force of gravity, which was pulling the book down. But since Professor B's lever arm was four times as long as the arm the book was resting on, he only had to pull with one quarter the amount of force, six newtons instead of 24. In other words, his input force was six and his output force was 24. And all you do to calculate the mechanical advantage of a machine is divide the output force by the input force. So Professor B's lever had a mechanical advantage of four. You'd like us to repeat the experiment, Professor A? You think you can equal Professor B's feat of lifting the book with a force of only six newtons? Very well. <laughs> Professor A is now setting an inclined plane against a block of wood 10 centimeters high. And the inclined plane is 40 centimeters long. Fine, that's four times the distance, so it should divide the force he needs by four, which means that his Newton spring scale should read six. What's this? Eight Newtons? Well, there it is. Professor B is still the winner with a force of only six Newtons thanks to the mechanical advantage of four given him by his lever. Whereas with Professor A's inclined plane, we see that he has a mechanical advantage of only three. Why is this? Why did the inclined plane have less mechanical advantage than the lever? Because of something we've forgotten about till now, the force of friction. Every time something rubs against something else, there's friction. In theory, Professor A should have been able to pull the book up the inclined plane with a force of only six newtons. But since friction was pulling in the opposite direction with a force of two newtons, the professor's pull had to total eight newtons. Professor B, on the other hand, was lucky because the amount of friction between the point of the fulcrum and the lever arm is almost zero. So the lever is a more efficient machine than the inclined plane because the inclined plane is plagued by the demon friction. But friction can be an angel as well, of course. Without friction between the tires of your car and the road, you wouldn't be able to drive. Or stop driving. Just as if there was no friction between the soles of your shoes and the floor. Eureka! The story so far. 
If you divide the force you get out of a machine by the force you put into it, you will discover the mechanical advantage of that machine. But since every machine involves contact between moving surfaces, its mechanical advantage will always be reduced to some extent by the force of friction. There's a lot of friction involved with the inclined plane, but hardly any with the lever. And now, the screw and the wheel. How many different types of simple machine do you think there are? Two. There are only two basic machines, the inclined plane and the lever. These are the mother and father of every machine in the world. All the others are merely variations on the same theme. For example, there's a beautiful machine. No, not your car. The road. Yes, the road. A winding mountain road is a machine, too. Well, suppose the road didn't wind. Suppose it went straight up the side of the mountain. This is a much shorter way to the top, isn't it? And yet, it won't do you much good, because the engine of even your magnificent automobile hasn't enough force to lift your car straight up. But suppose we make the road long enough and the slope gentle enough for you to drive up the mountain with ease. What have we done now? Yes, we've made the road into an inclined plane, a simple machine. But that's an expensive way to go up a mountain. It requires an awfully long ramp. What if we wrap the inclined plane round the mountain instead? Now we're back where we started, with a winding mountain road, which is really an inclined plane in disguise. A twisted inclined plane, if you like. There are twisted inclined planes all over the place. This includes every device that has a spiraling, corkscrewing action, and which allows you to trade extra turning distance for reduced force, either to help you lift things, or fasten things together. Here is the commonest example of all, the screw, which is, in fact, the very name which physicists give to every type of twisted inclined plane, the screw. So that's one of the descendants of the inclined plane. Hang on a minute. Can you give me an example of a simple machine that is descended from the lever? Well, you're holding one in your hand right now. Yet another machine that doesn't look like a machine. I know. But have you ever tried to open a door without a doorknob? You haven't got enough leverage, have you? That's where the doorknob comes in. It's a direct descendant of the lever. Like this. Or this. Or this. They're all children of the lever. How come? Well, a long time ago, some very wise men were looking at a lever one day, when they suddenly thought how nice it would be if the extra force the lever gives you to move something from here to here, say, four times the force, because one lever arm is four times the length of the other, they wondered if this extra force could be extended through 360 degrees. In other words, they wondered if they could make a circular lever, a lever that would go all the way round. And while they were at it, they made up a new name, an axle. With its center where the point of the fulcrum used to be, and the short arm of the lever now running from this center to the outside of the axle, and the long arm running from the center of the axle in the opposite direction. Now when you push the lever with a force, say, of 100 newtons, you can turn the whole axle around with a force of 400 newtons. And that's how you're able to open doors and steer cars and ships and pull up anchors with such ease, thanks to the ancient wise men and their circular lever. Yes, congratulations. You've just reinvented the wheel.